that it's time to start our webinar. And the first speaker tonight will be uh, Professor uh, Maria uh, Bellringer from the University of uh, or the o Auckland University of Technology, Director of the Gambling and Addiction uh, Research Center. And again, thank you very much, Maria, for being with us uh, today, tonight, and 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 uh, very interested to hear about uh, New Zealand and the related gambling related issues and regulations and policies. So thanks very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sultan. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Um, so, as Salt said, we're talking about gambling policy and regulations, and this is going to be a whirlwind tour of the New Zealand public health approach. Um, am I actually sharing my screen? Um, just want to check that I am actually sharing my screen. Okay. What? No. Oh, why is it not? Now, this is odd because it is showing that it's sharing. Hang on. Okay. Now I oh, think I'm perfect. sharing. Yes. yes. Excellent. Sure. Okay, good. Sorry about that little technological glitch. So this is uh, obviously policy and regulations is a big uh, subject. So this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour through the New Zealand approach, which is a public health approach to um, minimizing gambling harms. Uh, so I'd just like to start with showing you a world map because I know I'm aware that some people are not really sure where New Zealand is in the world and other people think it's next door to Australia, which um, isn't quite quite the case. So this, this flattened map has um, Europe and Africa in the centre and over in the far um, bottom right corner is New Zealand. So Australia is New Zealand's uh, closest neighbour, but the the closest distance is round about 3000 kilometres, so still a fair distance away. New Zealand's based in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, New Zealand's a small country, or in terms of land mass, it's, it's fairly similar to the land mass of the UK. Um, but in terms of population, New Zealand is a small country. We only have a population of 5.2 million people, which I'm aware is smaller than some major cities in Europe. So a, a small population on the land mass, the same size as the UK. Um, and to put it into context, the UK has around about 68 million people. So our um, gambling regulations come from our Gambling Act, which is 21 years old now, Gambling Act 2003. And the basic uh, premises of the, the Gambling Act are to control the growth of gambling uh, through licensing to prevent and minimize the harm caused by gambling uh, by general methods, the same as, as most other countries through things like age restrictions and um, placement of ATMs or cash machines, etc. Uh, the Gambling Act authorises some gambling to take place in New Zealand and prohibits uh, other types of gambling. It facilitates responsible gambling, uh, that means host responsibility from gambling venue providers, uh, ensures the integrity and fairness of gambling games, limits opportunities for crime or dishonesty associated with gambling, and this is particularly relevant for money laundering. Um, ensures that money from gambling benefits the community. And I think New Zealand is unique in that, um, that gambling proceeds, particularly from our non-casino electronic gaming machines, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, must benefit uh, charitable purposes. Uh, the law also requires community involvement in decisions about the provision of gambling, and this is at the, the um, government level, whenever any changes to the gambling or amendments to the Gambling Act or uh, other aspects of gambling provision are uh, are suggested that this has to go out for public consultation. Each of our local authorities, the local areas, uh, have to have a gambling venue policy, which is renewed every three years, has to take into account uh, socioeconomic benefits and harms from gambling. And those policies have to go for uh, community consultation before they are ratified. 
So as I mentioned, we have a public health approach, which means, uh, of course, that this is a prevention approach. It does not focus just on the problem gambler. It aims to prevent and minimize harm from gambling at all levels. So the, the Gambling Act recognizes that people experience varying levels of harm before they reach that problem gambling stage. So we're talking about low risk, and moderate risk gamblers here. Um, and it also recognizes that gambling harms affect families and communities, not just an individual. Probably a good idea if I just talk through the New Zealand gambling environment with you. So pretty similar to most other Western countries, we have six casinos. They are located in five cities. One city has two casinos. Uh, the casinos are standard. They have table games, which are the standard croupier operated games and also electronic table games. And we have electronic gaming machines in the casinos. Uh, we also have a variety of lottery products offered by the New Zealand Lotteries Commission. So this includes a national lottery called Lotto, scratch cards and Kino. And these are offered not, not only uh, in physical venues, but uh, in recent years have also been offered online. We have electronic gaming machines outside the casinos. These are called non-casino electronic gaming machines or NCEGMs. These are based in pubs and clubs around the country. The New Zealand Racing Board offers uh, betting on tra track betting, so horse and dog race betting and sports betting. And this can be done in venue at uh, what we call a TAB, uh, equivalent to a betting shop in, in the UK and Europe, uh, uh, and also can be done online. We have bingo, we have cards such as poker, poker games, uh, charity lotteries and raffles. And New Zealanders can access any form of um, gambling website. So the, this is online gambling that is not provided from within New Zealand, but provided outside the country, but New Zealanders can access any, any gambling website they wish to. The only online gambling that is allowed to be offered by New Zealand um, gambling operators is if it's through the Racing Board or the Lotteries Commission. Our Gambling Act has a very, very broad definition of harm uh, relating to distress of any kind arising from or caused or exacerbated by a person's gambling uh, and in includes personal, social and economic harm suffered by the person, so that's by the gambler, by their spouse or partner, family or wider community, in the workplace and by society at large. So you can see that this public health approach encompassing, encompasses harms that can affect at a current countrywide level, not just looking at harms to gamblers and, and those people immediately around the gamblers. We've had a few amendments to the Gambling Act since it was um, since it was uh, ratified back in 2003. The most latest is the Gambling Harm Prevention and Minimization Amendment regulations from last year. These relate only to non-casino electronic gaming machines, uh, recognizing that these are the most harmful form of gambling to New Zealanders. So the new regulations restrict jackpot advertising and branding. Um, it, one of the things is that these cannot be advertised outside the venue. There's a big requirement for staff of these venues, and these are pub and club venues uh, where alcohol and food and, and other things may, may occur. Um, they have to have problem gambling awareness training and they have to regularly sweep or visit the, the gaming floor to assess for harmful gambling. So these um, sweeps or visits to the gambling area and the gambling areas are always separate from where alcohol or food is served uh, within the venue. They, they have to be three within an hour, uh, at least 10 minutes apart, but more like 20 minutes apart. And if any gambler is seen to be uh, remaining at a machine for nine consecutive visits, then the staff have to approach that person and recommend that they take a break. There are restrictions on uh, ATM or cash machines uh, in and around venues and restrictions on vis visibility of machines from outside the venue um, in that you cannot now see any machines from outside the venue, have to go into the venue to see the machines. So our Gambling Act 
it was very, very good, but it is now out of date in relation to online gambling. Nothing has been updated in relation to online gambling. And of course, uh, back in 2003, online gambling was not really an issue. Um, now it's a big issue with so many thousands of websites uh, available, many are predatory, and we have no regulations or means of controlling people's access to online gambling uh, outside of this country. In terms of our regulation and legislation, uh, our Department of Internal Affairs is responsible for the regulation of gambling. So they conduct the compliance audits, they, they conduct all the monitoring and enforcement of the regulations. We have a gambling commission which comprises lawyers. They have powers of a commission of inquiry, so they hear about complaints and appeals and make decisions on those. They are also responsible for licensing the casinos and for advising the Minister of Health on the gambling levy, and I'll be mentioning the gambling levy um, in a moment. Um, the other department involved in uh, regulation and the harm minimization is the Ministry of Health, which under the Gambling Act is tasked with an, uh, providing an, in, an integrated problem gambling strategy. There are four arms to this strategy. It has to promote public health and minimize harms, harms from gambling, has to provide services, treatment services for gamblers and affected others, has to fund independent scientific research into gambling harms and treatments, and has to also evaluate the services. The Ministry of Health does this via a strategy which is refreshed um, every three years. So each strategy lasts for three years. Our current strategy has four objectives. And this uh, pyramid that I have here is like the, the public health pyramid where, where you go from public health um, approaches at the, the fat end of the pyramid to the pointy end, which is treating those people with the severe, with the severe problem. So this is a very similar uh, type of triangle to that. At the bottom of the triangle, so the, the public health side of things, we have strengthening the health and health equity of Maori, Pacific peoples, Asian peoples and young people. So this is addressing health inequities. Maori are New Zealand's indigenous population. Pacific peoples are people who are either born in the islands in, in the Pacific Ocean, islands like uh, Fiji, the Cook Islands, um, Nui, uh, Tonga, those sorts of places. So people born in those islands who now live in New Zealand or um, second generation Pacific people uh, who are born in New Zealand, but to, to people who have um, migrated from those countries. And similarly, Asian peoples are um, people who uh, mainly originate from East Asia and Southeast Asia um, and have migrated to New Zealand and then second generation. Uh, Maori, Pacific people, Asian and European are the four main ethnicities, but Maori, Pacific and Asian people have um, inequitable risk, higher risk for developing uh, gambling problems, uh, as do young people. So these are the priority groups in our current uh, objective to minimize gambling harm. Uh, the next uh, level on this pyramid is engaging with key stakeholders, uh, strengthening leadership and accountability to achieve equity for those population groups. One of the big issues we have in New Zealand is around our cultural and social norms in that gambling, uh, risky gambling behaviors and gambling harms still is very much of a, a hidden um, problem, hidden addiction, and there is still a lot of stigma associated with, um, with, with having a problem with gambling. So the aim in this current strategy is to increase public awareness around gambling harms and uh, have a destigmatization campaign. And then at the pointy end of this uh, this pyramid is the full spectrum of services and support. So these are the, the treatment services uh, and peer support. Our treatment services are all free. They are available to gamblers and anyone affected by someone's gambling. We 
We used to have a lot of treatment services around the country. We used to have two national treatment services and uh, a, a whole raft of regional services that um, either catered to the, the general population or specifically catered for Maori clients, Pacific clients or Asian clients. This has just been changed this year, just a couple of months ago. We now only have one national treatment provider, one Pacific treatment service and one Asian treatment service. They are just offered in really the main centres. We still have uh, a, quite a few Maori specific treatment services. So it, for us, it will be interesting to see what happens um, because of the changes. We also have a 24 seven uh, gambling helpline. Gambling activity and harms are all monitored. So we have a collection of gambling expenditure statistics, which are collected and collated by the Department of Internal Affairs. All the non-casino electronic gaming machines in pubs and clubs have an electronic monitoring system, which captures data on the money lost into the machines or the gross machine proceeds on the uh, usage of the machines and the location and number of machines at any given time. Uh, the Department of Internal Affairs also collects uh, gambling expenditure data for casinos, for track and sports betting at the TAB and from the lotteries products. Our treatment statistics are provided by all the treatment services uh, twice yearly to a central database, which is administered by the Ministry of Health. And the Ministry of Health also funds periodic national population level surveys so that we can, we can see uh, the extent or the prevalence of gambling behaviors and gambling harms um, from year to year. Uh, just a, a quick little graphic here of our gambling expen expenditure for, for the four main um, gambling operators. So the TAB, which is the, the track and sports betting, lotteries, non-casino, gaming machines and casinos. Um, you'll see that uh, there was a, a quite a big dip in 2019-2020, which is when COVID-19 arrived and we went into lockdown um, and physical venues were closed as in, in most places uh, the the two the, the two lines that increased from uh, that time or just before that time are the the orange line and the blue line which is lotteries and TAB and that's because they were both able to offer their products um, online which meant that physical closure of venues and people being um, having to stay at home meant that they could still keep gambling. And uh, just, just a graph here of clients who accessed our face-to-face -face treatment services. This is from the Ministry of Health's website, dating back to July 2004 through to June last year. Um, the, the blue line is the, the total clients. The, the green line is new clients who access the services in, in each year. And um, the grey line is existing clients, so clients who moved from one year to the next. And you can see that, that since about 2014, there's actually been a steady decline in new clients and therefore total clients who have access services. We don't know why. Um, and like I say, I'm really interested to see what happens now that the number of services has been uh, reduced. We have, uh, as part of the legislation, a gambling levy, which I just mentioned briefly earlier, is a mandatory levy uh, on the four major uh, the, the four major gambling operators, so casinos, uh, TAB or racing board, lotteries, and non-casino electronic gaming machines. This levy is to recover the cost of developing, managing, and delivering the the gambling strategy to reduce harm. Uh, the rates are set every three years to coincide with the, the revised strategy every three years. There is a formula uh, for each of the, the four um, gambling uh, providers, uh, and the formula considers the um, a proxy for the um, player expenditure, so a proxy for the amount of money lost by gamblers to each sector, and that's from player expenditure and a proxy to the harm caused by each gambling sector um, and that's by the people who seek treatment and the, um, the type of gambling that they cite as being their primary 
uh, reason for having a problem. And the levy also includes forecast player expenditure. This formula is set in legislation. The Gambling Commission sets the levy rates uh, following the Ministry of Health's recommendation. And then the, the Gambling Commission makes the final decision and informs the Ministry of Health what the levy will be for the next three years for each of these operators. There are pros and cons to the um, Having the mandatory levy, the, the benefits are that it ensures guaranteed levels of funding for gambling harm minimization activities in each three year period, and also that the gambling industry does not have any influence over how the money is spent. And before the Gambling Act, when we had a voluntary levy, that was not the case. The gambling industry did have a say as to where money went. Uh, the downside of this having this mandatory levy is that every three years the gambling industries argue over the accuracy of the formula and how much they have to pay, um, especially because uh, gambling presentation data at services is used as a proxy for harm. And as we know, um, only the most severely affected people actually go to services and it's only around about 15% of the, the prevalence rate of people classified as problem gamblers who go to seek help. So um, how accurate it is, is argued over every three years. The levy, of course, as I mentioned, doesn't consider money lost on overseas online gambling, and that has been increasing as online gambling has become more and more um, prevalent. And it only considers the primary problem gambling activity of people who present at treatment services. And most people will cite more than one gambling activity as causing them harm. Um, and this levy only considers the, what, what is stated to be the main problem gambling activity. I mentioned earlier we have a unique charitable model, um, particularly with our non-casino electronic gaming machines. So the um, the money lost by by gamblers to the machines or the the gross machine uh, proceeds what what the, is taken by its machine 40 percent a minimum of 40 percent of that money has to go back to the community or charitable purposes in terms of grants 35 percent goes to the government and that covers uh, levies and taxes and and those sorts of things and the the venues and and trusts uh, that uh, trusts own the machines and then lease them out to the, the venues who who host them the the venues and trusts can take a maximum of 16 percent of the machine proceeds so 40 percent or minimum of 40 percent has to go to charitable purposes which on the on the face of it sounds like a good thing um, but just very quickly, I'll show you this distribution of charitable funding. Uh, this is over three years, 2020, 21 and 22. And over on the left hand side, you can see that most of the funding goes to sports related events. Um, now, this might be buying um, sports equipment or, or um, kit for school children who are, uh, are in school teams and things uh, but sometimes it just really goes to support sporting activities and uh, you'll see that in the other bars uh, and in the table below a lot uh, a lot less of the money actually goes to other forms of charities um, and often the money is taken in by machines in certain areas, particularly the poorer areas, and then goes to charitable purposes in the rich areas. So this is not a, it's not a perfect model, um, although it sounds pretty good on the on the face of it. And I'm probably out of time now, so I will stop there and say thank you very much. And um, hopefully we have some chance for a couple of questions. Thank, thank you very much, Maria. It was a, a, a great lecture and great overview about the New Zealand situation. Thank you very much. And I, um, yeah, I didn't mention it in the in in the initial uh, in, in initial introduction that we uh, usually save the questions. So if there's nothing specific related to to the talk now, then then we can have a general discussion at the end of this. So we usually we have the three talks right after each other. I don't see any questions now in the Q&A uh, uh, chat box. So I, I would suggest moving forward to the next 
uh, talk and after the three talks we 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 can have a discussion and thank you again it uh, is really interesting to see the situation uh, in New Zealand and now we can move uh, towards Australia which is as you said uh, we can say that the neighboring country but still it's not on the corner as the more than 3000 kilometer away so I would like to welcome uh, Paul uh, Professor Paul uh, Del Fabro uh, professor uh, from the uh, uh, University of Adelaide and uh, and again, very much uh, honored to uh, Paul that you accepted our uh, invitation to provide an uh, an overview about the situation in in Australia. So thank you very much for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Right, thank, thanks very much, um, Salt. Um, I'll just um, share my screen and. Uh... Okay, how how are we looking? Is that looking okay? Yes, uh, maybe you can click on the present presenting mode and then. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. But otherwise, it's excellent. there. We go. Perfect. Thank you. Great. All right. My my talk will probably follow a little bit of a similar format to to Maria's, um, but probably in a slightly different order. Um, I think the first thing to say about Australia is that um, it's like the United States, it's a very, the legislation is much more fragmented uh, in many ways. I think um, the situation in New Zealand uh, is very sort of clear and clean because you have a single country with a single body of legislation, whereas Australia um, is something um, of, of a dog's breakfast, as we like to say in Australia. Um, it's, it's much more complex because of the different states and territories. So I thought it would be useful, like Maria did, to talk about the gambling market in Australia. So what does the what, what are the range of products which we have? A little bit about some of the trends, what's been happening in the gambling markets. And then the important thing is to draw attention to the fact that we are a, a commonwealth or a, a country with a, a federal um, legislative system um, which exists in combination with a series of um, states. And as we saw during COVID, um, we very much um, went back to being a series of very separated little colonies uh, when, when all state premiers had different views about COVID. So we, Australia is a, a complex country because of the difference between the states uh, and the federal laws. I'll talk a little, little bit about um, what are called codes of practice, which, which are used to reduce harm. And as Maria pointed out, public health approaches are very important and central to many of the um, decisions around gambling and the way in which we approach the reduction of gambling harm. Many of the uh, states and territories refer to reducing harm as a principal focus uh, rather than solely a focus upon um, problem gambling. Um, I'll talk about some of the current regulatory and policy issues which are particularly topical at the moment uh, and then some of the challenges, uh, many of which do arise from the separation of powers between the states uh, and the federation. Well, uh, the three main categories of gambling in Australia, we have, um, of course, gaming machines. Uh, that's, that's probably the most notorious form of gambling in Australia, so state-based gaming. Uh, we also have table games in casinos, um, only in casinos, um, unless it's a very illegal operation somewhere in, in the back streets. Uh, we have wagering activities, of course, sports uh, and racing. And then we have uh, a variety of lottery-based products, uh, principally draw-based lotteries and also retail scratch cards which you purchase across the counter uh, we don't have any uh, electronic instant win games like you have in parts of europe and in places such as of ireland uh, every state and territory um, has a casino um, and electronic gaming machines are located in hotels and clubs um, everywhere in australia except in western australia so western australia is of course the huge um, mass here um, and the biggest casino in Australia is of course Crown Casino in in Melbourne and we also have of course Star Casino over in uh, New South Wales so we, ha we have um, a couple of very big international casinos and then a, a variety of smaller and medium-sized casinos across the country you probably say um, the, the Perth Casino is pretty big too for Crown um, 
sports betting, um, most of the online sports betting in Australia is licensed in the Northern Territory because they historically got better tax conditions there. And bookkeepers operate nationally, uh, and many have headquarters on the East Coast as well. Uh, Northern Territory government saw the opportunity to have sports betting companies located there because it, it had certain strategic economic uh, reasons for doing that. Um, and so one of the debates over the last few years has been around um, companies located in the territory operating, offering services to customers located in the other states and territories, which has been an ongoing debate over the last few years. Uh, people in Australia, if you want to go off and gamble, um, you, you go to clubs and hotels. Um, and there are some lottery products such as Kino, which you can play at hotels. Um, clubs can be very small. Um, some of the ones in South Australia where I live are quite small, only 20 machines, but you can get these huge, uh, what are essentially mini casinos in New South Wales. If, if you're familiar with New South Wales or Sydney, um, some of these are very, very big um, uh, operations. Um, hotels usually around the country have 10 to 40 machines. And we have the big centrally located casinos. Um, and you can you can also buy lottery products um, at news agents. I often find I go to buy the paper or something at a news agent. I'm usually waiting for all the people to buy their scratchies before I can um, be served. Uh, and we still have street side betting outlets, bookies, uh, track side uh, betting outlets as well. So that, that's how you go to to, to gamble uh, in Australia. Uh, of course, I've got online gambling as well. Now. The distinctive feature of Australia is the ability to walk off the street and gamble. It is very easy just to wander down through Adelaide, for example. You can walk into, out from the university, and walk into multiple venues and start playing poker machines without any ID checks, without any barriers at all, uh, except if you're, um, you're young. Um, we have a lot of community-located venues, um, often near shopping centres or even in shopping centres. Uh, we, we don't have any machines in convenience stores, so I remember I was walking around Norway and you, know, you walk around the UK, you have machines in train stations. In Vegas, of course, you have them at the airport. Um, in Australia, you do actually have to go to a gambling venue for most land-based um, activities. So we do, we do have that barrier to uh, accessibility. Online gambling, of course, has been much of the discussion of policy debates over the last few years. And this is regulated by the Interactive Gambling Act. Uh, this essentially limits online gambling in Australia to wagering. Um, it prohibits the offer of online casino games, in-play sports betting, betting on lottery outcomes, um, and so on. So online gambling in many ways is less accessible in Australia. You can't um, gamble legally on an online casino, play online slot games like you can in Europe. Uh, of course, in Europe, you've got a whole range of different types of slot machines which you can play. Uh, participation rates in Australia. Australia doesn't actually have a, a participation rate in gambling that's any higher than many other countries. It's around 60 to 70 percent of adults gamble at least once per year. Uh, and, and most of it is, in fact, just buying a weekly lottery ticket. Um, one reason why people are surprised when they see statistics saying, well, most people in the community have a negative attitude towards gambling is, is, is the reason. The reason is that most people actually don't gamble very much. If you take out lotteries, it's really only a about you know, a third of the population or less who actually really gamble on uh, what we call harder forms of gambling. For example, EGM participation is only around 20% and even lower in many surveys. Sports is about 12 to 15%. Um, weekly EGM participation is often only about 2 or 3% of the adult population. An interesting thing there, of course, is that when you see that billions of dollars are being spent um, you realise that a very high proportion of that expenditure comes from a very small proportion of players. Um, either that or people are laundering lots of money through um, uh, various locations. It, it's a, it seems like a remarkably high amount. Um, so participation expenditure has become increasingly concentrated uh, in Australia. We, we've got problem gambling rates which have been stable or dropping and yet the expenditures remain reasonably constant, even, even adjusting for um, inflation. It's a bit of a myth to say that Australia is the number one country for EGMs. It's certainly the case that we spend more on these types of this type of gambling anywhere, anywhere else. We also, New South Wales also does not have 20% of the world's high-intensity game machines, but we are number one 
um, for expenditure per capita on gambling. And much of this is due to the fact that EGMs are very accessible uh, in the community. So we're the highest spender on gambling um, in the world. Even though we don't necessarily have a higher proportion of the population participating in gambling. Uh, our total net expenditure is around about 25 to 26 billion uh, from year to year. That, that's net, net expenditure. And the reason is that we not only have um, EGMs being so accessible, we have very high numbers of machines. I think um, we've got 85,000 thereabouts in New South Wales. Um, and the machines are high intensity, meaning we don't have the lower impacts, so, you know, like the category uh, D machines like you see in the UK with relatively small, small stake sizes and payouts. Uh, all our machines are at the high end. Now, the structure of legislation, the federal government oversees online gambling and wagering. Uh, we have a, department, a federal department of social services, which um, has a set of national gambling reforms. And we also have the other important body to talk about is the AMCA, which covers advertising of gambling and messaging. And they've had quite a lot of role in uh, many of the debates around discussions around sports betting and the saturation of sports betting advertising. That's been a, a point of national discussion uh, over the last few years. And one of the recent federal initiatives that's very topical is BetStop, which is a national self-exclusion register across online wagering providers. Uh, we also have consistent, safer gambling messages. Um, you win more than you lose, uh, those sorts of messages. Um, there's a requirement to, for online providers to provide activity statements about people's gambling, uh, voluntary limit setting, uh, and then restrictions on some inducements and the use of credit cards. Um, for example, Australia has banned the use of deposit bonuses, so having either affiliates or direct operators providing bonuses for signing up to an account. Uh, you still, however, have bonus bets, but not those um, deposit um, bonuses anymore. Now, much of the legislation to do with gambling is state-based. So much of what Maria was talking about with New Zealand is, is replicated right across the country uh, and is slightly different across the country, although there are many similarities. So each state has its own Gaming Machine Act, uh, its own Casino and Lottery Acts, and, and some states have tried to consolidate those uh, into single acts, but it's, it's proved difficult. We've had situations where we've had single or multiple ministers involved in the industry regulation, um, but then the social communities departments then funding the welfare and health services. So we've had situations where I know in South Australia, you had to go and speak to about four different ministers in order to um, cover all of gambling. One who was covering the health services, one who was in charge of gaming, one who was in charge of lotteries, which was put in with tourism and those sorts of things. So it can be very, very difficult. Each jurisdiction um, has a regulator or commissioner who approves gambling licenses and takes enforcement action and drafts legislation. So uh, unlike like in New Zealand, when you have a New Zealand commission, we have our own separate commissions right across the country uh, and often located in different departments. Uh, and sometimes the enforcement legislation arms can be separated or they're, they're put together. Uh, and, and then we usually have some sort of office of problem gambling or equivalent who then focuses upon the harm education and services and outreach and those sorts of things. So it's always something of a dilemma. You've got one part of the government which is involved with the approval of um, gaming licenses and the provision of gambling services to the community. Then you've got another part which is, which is, which is there to fix up the, the problems which that causes. Then you've got treasuries, treasury departments which sit there saying, well, don't do too good a job just in case um, our revenue drops too much. So there's always the, this tension between the different um, arms of government. Because in Australia, we do we do drive, or the states drive something like 15% um, of their revenue from, from gambling in some cases. Uh, examples of some of the regulatory, important regulatory bodies, we have the Victorian Gambling Casino Control Commission, SA Consumer and Business Serv Services, Liquor and Gaming New South Wales, Department of Treasury and Finance. The, these are the, the, the uh, departments in the different states uh, which, which look after the regulation of gambling. Uh, most of the um, gambling acts um, have a code of practice, and these are often rolled out and separated for the different types of gambling, casinos, sometimes for lotteries, for gaming. Uh, most of these can be voluntary, 
uh, mandatory and prescribed. You must do A, B, and C to meet the, legisl the legislation. Um, you can have a mandatory one, which simply says you must have a code, but then the industry then determines the, the form in which that takes. Um, some states and territories have mandatory and prescribed codes. In other words, there's a code there, and then the industry must do certain things as prescribed in the legislation. Uh, New South Wales um, has a, a voluntary one, but still has quite strict licensing requirements. So it's a, it's a bit of a debate about what's truly mandatory and what's voluntary. Um, but th those sort of labels are often used to describe the different codes of practice. Uh, nearly all parts of Australia, like in New Zealand, adhere to a public health approach, which focuses upon minimising and preventing harm and manifested in policy statements, which often um, try to reduce harm to zero, which is, of course, a difficult aim, but that, that's often the, the, the byline of many of these policy statements. Uh, and much of this is then tried, uh, codified into the codes of practice. Uh, the codes of practice usually have some of the uh, usual things like information about gambling risks provided to customers, self-exclusion schemes, um, the preclusion of minors from gambling venues, uh, mandatory staff training, uh, indicators of harm being used to detect people who might be showing signs of gambling problems, um, advertising and promotion restrictions, signage restrictions, and, and things such as the access to credit cards or use of credit cards is usually banned. Uh, and also legislation around where uh, bank machines can be located uh, in the venues. The major challenge in Australia uh, is the lack of consistency in legislation. Um, there's different types of machine, um, types of sizes of venues, operating hours across the country, what is mandatory and what's voluntary. Um, online gambling can affect state-based re residents, but of course it's under federal legislation. And so it's often difficult for federal reforms to be implemented at a state level. At least this has been the challenge historically. The federal government might say, well, we'd like to see gambling reform in the country. And then the state governments will, you might say, who might even be for different political parties say, well, we don't really want um, to lose too much of our revenue. Well, if we're going to do that, then the other state north of us must do the same thing. Otherwise, people will migrate across the, the border or go online. So state governments worry about their tax base. And of course, the technology may vary across the country. Uh, which we saw in, in the 2010 pre-commitment trial, which was a, uh, a federal commitment to bring in voluntary pre-commitment. Um, they thought about doing a trial with the ACT, only to find that it didn't have a central monitoring system that, that would make that um, type of technology very easy to apply. So, for example, in this, this particular reforms, major industry groups in some states uh, strongly opposed the... Um, these federal uh, legislations, and then uh, this never quite got off the ground. You see a lot of debate about um, gambling migration, and much of the history of Australia has been about um, states following one another. So, for example, if a particular state introduces game machines, the other state will then worry, well, all revenue is going to go across the border, uh, so we need to do, uh, we, we need to introduce the machines as well. So the history in the 1990s up to now has been that states tend to follow one another. Uh, and as you can see from the map, um, yeah, there are many border towns where there's always a debate about if you introduce quite strict laws in New South Wales, well, people might go to Queensland because cross the border uh, in a 20-minute drive or longer drive if they wanted to to, to play there. That's, 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 of course, always been a debate uh, about which has is, which is, uh, arisen in other parts of the world too, such as in the states where you had the riverboat casinos going down the river and people able to jump on and gamble where um, their, their own states might not have allowed them to to do certain things. So, so there's probably I'd probably say now there's more national direction um, because I think there's a general shared sense across the country that there's too much sports advertising. Everyone's fed up with it. It's all over um, sporting broadcasts. Uh, and I think the, the rise of online gambling has led to some um, more consolidated approaches where the, the states and, and, and the federal government agree that we, we need some changes. Um, as I said, state and territory laws probably have more similarities now than differences, um, but there are still issues where the states find it difficult to take action that easily when, when the source of the gambling uh, comes national. All right, so I'll, I'll leave it there and um, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. It was an excellent overview again. So it's, 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 we are really getting to have a nice picture now. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, that uh, is also that we can now move forward and hear a little bit about Indonesia uh, from uh, <clears throat> Professor Christina Sisti. Uh, and uh, Christina, thank you also for being with us uh, today. Uh, Christina is working at the Department of Mental Health uh, Sciences at the University of Indonesia. And uh, again, very much uh, thank you for being with us and looking forward to hear your presentation. And again, I, sorry, just one more second. So it's, uh, I would also encourage the audience that if you have any questions related to either the first two uh, presentations or the one we are going to be, <clears throat> we, we will hear now, just please uh, write your questions in the Q&A chat. And after this talk, we will have the chance to have a general discussion. Christian, the floor is yours and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Zal, for the nice introduction. I will share my slide first. Okay, I hope you can see my slide. So hello everyone, I'm Christiana Sister from the Department of Psychiatry, University of Indonesia. And thank you for this opportunity to share about our experience about gambling policy and regulation in Indonesia. So this is my uh, first slide. Uh, this is uh, our map in, in Indonesia country. So we are archipelago uh, country. We have around more than 13,000 islands. And uh, we are fourth populous country in the world with 280 million people and 20% of them are adolescents. And uh, as archipelago country, we have uh, many challenges in accessible uh, health services around uh, the country. And also we have challenge in an un unequal uh, number of physicians, specifically for psychiatric uh, ratio. We have uh, only 1,221 psychiatrists in, the, in uh, Indonesia, in our country. So compared to our population, it means that one psychiatrist uh, serve around uh, 230,000 uh, person in our country. So it means that we have many challenges in uh, mental uh, health services in our uh, country, and we have just uh, uh, we have just thirty two per, uh, addiction psychiatrists in uh, Indonesia. So we have uh, a huge and big challenges in addiction services uh, treatment in Indonesia. And uh, in a survey uh, for internet penetration, around 10, uh, 80 percent of person or people in our country. Uh, penetrated uh, internet uh, use in uh, Indonesia, and most of them use internet uh, via uh, mobile phone. So it's very easy to use internet uh, by mobile phones. And uh, most of them, uh, around 98%, uh, uh, they are from uh, 13 until 18 years old, and around 97%, uh, around uh, 19 until 34 uh, years old. It means that uh, the age around uh, adolescents and young adults. So they are vulnerable uh, population to have a uh, disorder because of internet penetration like gambling disorder and gaming uh, disorder. And uh, from our uh, last uh, study uh, during COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we have around uh, 6,000 uh, sample or subject in our uh, country nationally. We have prevalence of gambling disorder around 2%. And uh, most of them, uh, the gambling type of population with gambling, gambling disorder, most of them are play uh, sport betting and poker and slot machine and also card games. And there is no significant difference between male and uh, female because they are equal number between a male and female. And uh, around 70% of them uh, age uh, around 18 until 25 years old. It means they are uh, young adult. Most of them are young adult. And uh, around 70% uh, use smartphones for gambling. So it's very easy to access uh, online gambling by a uh, smartphone. And the interesting data uh, which uh, mentioned that in our study uh, found that around 18 
0.5 percent uh, perceive that they did not uh, have gambling uh, behavior. So it means that the insight of the or the awareness of them to have a gambling disorder is quite poor. So it means uh, there will be delay onset of the treatment. They will not go to the treatment center to get the treatment for gambling disorder. And we can see here there is a, a switching from on offline gambling to online gambling before COVID-19 pandemic. Offline gambling uh, are very uh, famous, uh, like uh, we can see here, like chicken dress and then lottery and card uh, betting. So when we have a COVID-19 pandemic and after COVID-19 pandemic, online gambling are very famous in our country. But the server of our uh, online gambling is for is from foreign country, not from local, uh, not from the local or from our country. And uh, game online, online gambling are easily accessed uh, by PC or smartphone. And there is gamification trend in gambling. So uh, with gambling, uh, with uh, online gambling, we can see there is gamification. So it's like uh, using a uh, gaming uh, with a uh, gambling as schema. So it's more interesting to play game online gambling compared to offline gambling. And uh, because of online gambling is increasing in our country, there are many social problems uh, increasing also in our country. For example, uh, because uh, the people then uh, borrow the money from illegal debt, so they will unable to pay loan uh, due to their gambling behavior. And because of that, several people option uh, choose to committing thefts or then uh, they and their own life by suicide. So this slide show us many uh, news for, uh, in the in media mass or television uh, mention about uh, uh, several people who are committing to thefts like uh, in this uh, slide, uh, show the news that uh, two, young, uh, two young adults committing uh, thefts because they cannot, uh, they cannot pay a lot due to their gambling behavior. And then there is a uh, a, a young uh, mother then kill him uh, herself because of a uh, disorder due to gambling disorder and then in our country gambling disorder uh, doesn't uh, doesn't uh, just uh, doesn't um, doesn't know about uh, economical status it means that uh, gambling disorder can impact from low economic economical status until high economical status. So in this slide, it mentioned that uh, the owner of the very uh, big expedition in our country killed uh, himself because unable to pay a loan due because uh, gambling behavior. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't just uh, impact just the low economical status, but also high economical status in our country. And how about our regulation in our country? Actually, gambling disorder, gambling behavior is prohibition in our country. And uh, we have uh, several regulation about gambling. So uh, like this one, in 1975, uh, there, uh, there is a stated in, regu in regulation in 1975, all act of gambling is a crime. But this is just a uh, uh, and also in 2016, there is prohibition of online gambling. But then for punishment, especially uh, it mentioned just for offline uh, gambling for the organizer and operators. So the punishment will be 10 years maxima in prison or around uh, 1,700 US dollar max fine. And for players of offline gambling, uh, four years maxima in prison or uh, 600 or seven, uh, near 700 US dollar max fines. Uh, sorry, I think the internet connection is not stable. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, sorry. And then, but uh, how about on online gambling? So for online gambling, uh, it's regulated by uh, by regulation in 2016, but 
but for the punishment, it's only for the distributor and operator six years maximal in prison and or one billion rupiah or around uh, 66 or near 70 US dollar max fine. But it's not regulated about the player. It's just regulated for distributors and operators for online gambling. So uh, the regulation regulate about offline gambling, but it's not regulated for online gambling for the players, but only for distributor and operators. And this is the current challenges for gambling disorder in our country, because in our country, there is no policy uh, regulating international online gambling servers. Many servers in our country is from foreign countries. So uh, when the government will ban the server, it cannot be happen. So when uh, uh, the patient come to us, the clinician, and we can we cannot uh, ban the website because the server is for is from foreign country, and there is no policy regulating online gambling player like I mentioned uh, before in the previous slide, and also the uh, the policy regulating illegal online lender isn't commonly known by society. Uh, it's very important to regulate illegal online lender because. The main source of suicidal thought found in gambling disorder patient is a dear loan from illegal online lender because the lender, the online, the illegal online lender can threatening the family and also the patient. So it will be very important to regulate illegal online lender. And then because of the culture in our country, family members are expected by society to pay patient loan. And then uh, the family uh, will pay all uh, the loans. So the patient treatment adherence will decrease due to paying loan. So when the family pay all the loans, the, the patient doesn't want to get the treatment anymore. So the motivation to undergo the treatment will uh, be uh, lost or there is no motivation an, uh, anymore. And then the other uh, challenges is about stakeholder perspective of gambling related harm because uh, uh, many stakeholders did not realize the magnitude of gambling-related harm because they don't realize the, the problem or the magnitude of the huge problem of gambling-related harm. They think that uh, there is no need adequate intervention uh, for the gambling disorder. And the other challenge is our national health insurance does not cover for gambling disorder. So not many patients come to the health services for gambling disorder treatment because the insurance uh, does not cover the gambling disorder treatment. And like uh, Maria mentioned and also uh, Paul mentioned, it is very important to define harm for gambling disorder. And uh, this is the public uh, this is the public health approach because with defining harm so we can uh, educate the public about the magnitude problem of gambling disorder and we can identify the first hand and second hand harm so it not it uh, it doesn't uh, just impact the patient or the the person but it also impact the family and we can uh, do list of the impact or the harm and we can uh, uh, we can determine the hierarchy of the harm of the patient and uh, to define the harm, so we uh, should uh, meet the specific tool to measure the harm. And then we can uh, use the uh, meet uh, the specific tools for public health and also clinical prior priorities. And we can do the survey uh, to the patient. And then we can be de defining or de determining the harm for gambling disorder. And we can educate and also we can uh, advocate the government about the about the huge problem or magnitude problem of gambling disorder. And what uh, we have done in Indonesia, so this is uh, several activities that we have done in Indonesia. We try to advocate the government about the gambling disorder problem. So since 2017, we joined WHO Addictive Behaviors Forum, and this is the first initiator on set for action in Indonesia. So we try to advocate the government by our research. Uh, we try to collaborate with Indonesian Ministry of Research and Technology, and we develop the module for a prevention, internet addiction, and also substance. And we uh, spread this module uh, into school and also uh, the colleagues, uh, the college and uh, and a school, of course. And then 
in this early year, the government has realized the magnitude of the problem and they plan to build the specialized online gambling hospital in our capital city, Jakarta. And the other, uh, the other activities, uh, we also advocate the government to uh, do the regulation about advertisement about online gambling regulation because uh, online gambling regulation will increase the craving for the patient. Uh, and it can pop up uh, anywhere, maybe, uh, for example, in YouTube or in social media. And then we also advocate the government uh, to enhance parents and individual awareness regarding online gambling and illegal debt. Uh, and also we, uh, we try to develop the self-detection, it's online application, and we try to advocate to uh, government to spread the self-detection on gambling problem so the person or the people can access the self-detection very easy uh, from the home. And then we try to advocate the uh, government to develop treatment and the rehabilitation uh, center because it's very important and we have many uh, islands, so it's very important to have many treatment and rehabilitation center in our country. And then uh, we try to uh, to arrange the webinars for general practitioner, also counselor, and other mental health professional, and also peers educator trainings in school, so they know about gambling disorder, and then and then they can uh, spread the knowledge uh, to their friends. And then we try to increasing public awareness through popular media like newspaper, television, and also radio to more diverse uh, population from adolescent until uh, adults. And also uh, we have uh, in academic and research, uh, we have a curriculum for general psychiatry resident about uh, uh, addictive behavior, including gaming and gambling disorder. We also have curriculum for addiction psychiatry subspecialists uh, about gaming and gambling disorder. And also we uh, collaborate with uh, national drug uh, board uh, they have uh, several patients with gambling disorder and our uh, registrar learn from uh, National Narcotic Board. And we also develop uh, application because uh, adolescents and young adults like to uh, access application, online application. And we uh, develop application and website to screen behavioral addiction in adolescent and young adults. Also, uh, application to provide information and screen for behavior addiction and also application to screen for behavioral addiction risk factor. Uh, so many people can access uh, this application from uh, many uh, regions in Indonesia. And also we uh, develop National Behavioral Addiction Study Center. We hope from the research, then we can uh, have operational research and then we can develop the treatment for the patient with gambling disorder. And because we have many islands in our country, we try to develop internet-based uh, CBT. We call it ICBT module for, uh, for gambling disorder, collaborate with Flinders University. So we can uh, do online CBT uh, for many people uh, in different uh, region or in different island. We also develop repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation treatment for gambling disorder, and we collaborate with Indonesian Ministry of Research and uh, Technology. So we try to uh, develop new modality for gambling disorder. And also we try to collaborate with Indonesian Psychiatric Association to do seminars and workshops about gambling disorder for general practitioners and psychiatrists all over Indonesia. And also, uh, we try to spread uh, about knowledge about CBT and DBT for gambling uh, disorder. And we collaborate with International Addiction Fellowship Training to, uh, for, of Kurihama and also Flinders uh, University. And uh, for the uh, patient, we develop National Behavioral Addiction Treatment Center for gambling disorder and others uh, behavioral uh, addiction like gaming uh, disorder. But then we focus on gambling disorder patient. We hope, we hope that we can, uh, uh, we can give comprehensive therapy for patient with uh, gambling disorder, included for the family and also uh, for financial uh, problem. And for the tech home message, uh, it's very important uh, to have collaboration to treat the patient with gambling disorder. And it's very important to increase awareness and action against addictive behavior in our, our country, in Indonesia. And of course, 
We need synergy between governmental bodies, public health professional, clinician, researcher, and community uh, for compre comprehensive harm reduction. So uh, this is uh, my presentation, and thank you for this opportunity, Zot, and back to you. Thank you, Zot. Uh, thank you very much, Christiana, and thank you all three of you for the excellent talks and the contributions. And, and indeed, now we have an uh, overview about uh, three countries, two quite different countries in, 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 in terms of very different patterns. So it was, it was really very exciting to listen listening to these uh, presentations and we have a few questions already and we have about 15 20 minutes for discussion so so yeah maybe the first question is 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 to maria i don't know if you could uh, read it so i was it's um, i was wondering if there's any different approach to the therapeutic services offered to maori and polynesian New Zealanders? Do they use the standard approaches from Western therapeutic uh, currents or, or or anything else or other approaches? Right, yes. Um, yes, one of the reasons that we have the Maori specific services and Pacific specific and, and also Asian specific services is because these populations of these the, these cultures are different from the Western culture. Um, and so it's it's quite important to be able to provide uh, services uh, in a culturally appropriate way. So each different service actually, because there are many different ways of working uh, traditionally with Maori, with Pacific people and with, with Asian people, um, each service offers offers their service in a slightly different way. And we have to remember, particularly for the Polynesian or the Pacific peoples, that although we call them Pacific people, they actually comprise multiple different islands and different cultures. So we, uh, Tongans are slightly different from Samoans, from Nuaeans, from, from people from the Cook Islands. Um, so the, the way the services are provided is different. And I can, I'm, I'm not so um, familiar with the way Maori treatment services are provided because they're they're funded separately um, from our from our Health New Zealand. Uh, I'm sorry, from our Maori Health Authority, uh, whereas other treatment services are funded by Health New Zealand. Um, but for Pacific services, they will often, whereas a Western a Western service, people will go for a one to one session where the, the, the client will go and sit down with the counsellor. With Pacific services, they're, they're very much um, family oriented and the culture is very much that any problem affecting one person, uh, th there's a little proverb that affects the whole village. You need the whole village for the one person to get better. So particularly you need the whole family to be involved. So often the whole family will, will either go to the treatment service or the counsellor will actually go to the family's home to provide um culturally relevant therapy so it is different they may use aspects of cbt or motivational interviewing and and the traditional types of therapies but they will deliver it in a in a manner that is culturally appropriate um, but having said that uh, all the services are funded from these central um, government operated uh, bodies and they have to collect specific data and do certain things so any cultural culturally based approaches are constrained by the overarching western approach because the funding is from westernized government um well, yeah, so hopefully hopefully that answers pedro's question i i, I think so and i know i mean if Paul, do you have anything to add from an Australian perspective and the indigenous population or Christian also? I mean, from I mean, there are very different culture, uh, people with very different cultural background. And if you have any, well, just if you have anything to add or. Yeah, well, yeah, Australia, we tend to have a sense, like Maria said, we have a levy imposed upon the industry in the different states and territories, which usually funds the 
services, uh, and usually the services will have um, specialist services for Aboriginal people and also for other uh, culturally, linguistically diverse people. So we will have a uh, Vietnamese service in Adelaide. We've got a service for Chinese people uh, and several Aboriginal services, some in the regional areas, some in, in, the, in, the, in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a, a few questions regarding Indonesia, but of course, feel free, uh, also Mari and Paul, to to uh, <clears throat> add to it. Um, Christiana is uh, so. One question is: says, What roles do allied health pra practitioners, such as psychologists, social workers, general practitioners, uh, and others, can? Uh, have uh, in the treatment and help to uh, helping to the uh, gam uh, problem gambling pro problem gamblers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. So, so, no, sorry. Go for it. Go for it. Sorry. So okay, Christiana, continue, and then Paul will come next. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Zod. Yeah. Thank you. So um, yes, it's very important to collaborate between general practitioner, uh, social worker, psychologists, and also psychiatrists to treat gambling disorder. So in our country, general practitioner usually detect, uh, uh, do early detection of gambling disorder, and then uh, they do basic counseling, and then uh, they refer to the uh, psychiatrist uh, to do the advanced uh, treatment for gambling disorder patient. And then social worker, they work in the community and do basic counseling for the patient. And then they will refer to the psychiatrist to advance a treatment for the patient with gambling disorder. And also a psychologist will work with a psychiatrist to do the treatment, giving a psychotherapist like a cognitive behavioral therapy and also like a dialectical behavioral therapy for the patient. And for financial counselor, we don't have financial counselor actually, but in clinical setting, we, uh, we also discuss about money management. For example, the patient with gambling disorder, they, they just can have uh, cash money, not credit card, not ATM, but they just can uh, a small amount of cash money. And then uh, they cannot uh, also like uh, banking in their phone. Uh, they cannot access that uh, in the treatment. So we have money management in the treatment. Thank you, and Paul. Want to add something? Yeah, I I don't know if Paul had something to add, or y yes, I I need to say that the the funding models for services uh, tend to partition the funding into different types of. Uh, services. So there's usually a psychological therapy service, which includes CBT. Uh, there's usually financial counselling, legal services. Uh, the, the big debates in Australia are, are, are to do with whether you have a, uh, we, we tend to have a, what's called an all uh, open door policy where you can go to any of those services. But uh, one of the things that we're trying to develop in Australia is a triage system where you can get some sort of centralised assessment. Uh, which then gets the person to the right place. So it's, it's, it's usually both combination of social work and psychology, which comes to be involved with the, with the treatment um, and counselling process. Thank you. And it's again a question which is set in relation to Indonesia, but I think it can be interesting in, in, in any of these countries. Uh, of course, it's, it's specific with the 13,000 islands in, in Indonesia that, that the, the delivery of the service, so if you use e-health or, or specifically or smartphone-based uh, approaches or, or more land-based, uh, well, yeah, so it's obviously also a question related to the availability of the different services in, in, a, in a country with this type of uh, special demographics and special geography also. So yeah, we have around uh, 13,000 islands. So now we currently uh, try to develop uh, internet-based uh, CBT. So we try to develop online CBT for the patient with gambling disorder. It's still in the research uh, currently, but we try to distribute nationally after the research have done. 
but we have this uh, kind of uh, method, uh, treatment method for substance use disorder, and it's very effective to uh, reduce the craving and also reduce the relapse. So we want to do also for gambling disorder, but it's still in the research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question related to Indonesia uh, that is gambling regarded a major public health issue for all Indonesians or, or do you experience more higher prevalence rates among the non-Muslim uh, community or, or do you know any differences according to uh, yeah, different populations? Yes, so actually gambling is prohibited in Muslim religion, but in our study, we found that uh, religion is not a protective factor for gambling disorder. And in my experience in clinical settings, so we have many patients from uh, diverse religion, from many uh, religions, so it's not just from others uh, than Muslim, but we have many patients from varied uh, religion. And uh, religion is not protective factors for gambling disorder in our study. Thank you. And then we have a question to Paul. Uh, do you believe that responsible gaming gambling issues are somewhat decreasing segment of larger behavior addictions such as internet gaming disorders? Yeah, uh, a little bit hard to understand the question actually. Um... Yeah. yeah, can you repeat it? Um, so, it, it, it's a question that is responsible gambling. Um, Somewhat decreasing segment of larger behavior addiction, such as internet gaming disorders. I'm not hundred percent sure how to interpret the question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, a general view, uh, I guess, comments on responsible gambling is that there's a, a shift away from that sort of language in Australia towards using terms like safer gambling and um, so the, the, the public health approach has taken some precedence over the that, that terminology for responsible gambling. Um, but many of the same issues uh, would apply to um, to gaming where there's an element of gambling. So there's, there's talk of uh, there being certain features, of course, of gaming which are more gambling-like where there's seen to be the need to make those safer. So, so some of the same sort of debates you're seeing in gambling are transferring across to discussions of, of gaming as well. Hey, thank you. And then there's a question related to, uh, uh, it's again Australia. So do you think that uh, Australia has the highest rate of gambling expenditure and is there any correlation with other addictive behaviors um pro probably no more so than any, any other country um i think the uh, there, there are certain um there is certainly a, a high correlation between for example smoking and, and problems associated with gambling so you'll find that pe of people who are classified as having gambling problems you, you'll find 60 percent will be smokers uh, the connection with alcohol was probably not quite so strong, but uh, it is the case that um, there's evidence that people who who drink more properly uh, and gamble more when they drink, um, there's some of that sort of evidence. But I wouldn't think the association um, between a cross addiction association was any stronger in Australia than than other countries. Thank you, uh, thank you. And there's a question to Maria. Uh, what is the negative impact of the recent rollback of the Maori language use in the New Zealand government service in the context of providing responsible gaming, gambling intervention to diverse New Zealand communities? Um, it's not really a rollback of the Maori language. It's that uh, under the previous government, all our government departments uh, use the Maori name first and then the, the, the English name second. Uh, so, for example, Health New Zealand in the Maori language is Te Whata Ora, so everybody knew of the, the department as Te Whata Ora, Health New Zealand. Now it's swapped around, so now it's Health New Zealand, Te Whata Ora, so English is first. So it's not going to really have any effect in terms of um, treatment service 
provision or access to treatment services. The, the, the big changes that we've just had where we had two national services and lots of uh, Pacific and Asia, uh, Pacific services, particularly and regional services, and these have been cut to one national, one Pacific and one Asian service, that is probably going to have more effect um, in that before there were services not only in the main cities, but in the regional areas as well. Um, now the services are just in the main cities um, and people in regional areas will have to access the services, not face to face, but uh, probably via e-health or uh, other telehealth, that sort of um, means. So that could affect uh, access to services. In terms of Maori services, we still have, I think, around about a dozen Maori services that include in regional areas. So hopefully, uh, Maori in, uh, hopefully the services in the areas where um, Maori are inequitably affected, where more Maori are experiencing gambling harm. Hopefully the services are in those areas, but we, we wait to see. But I don't think the government's stance on having English first ahead of the Maori language will make much difference. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, <clears throat> there's one question related to Indonesia. Uh, do you think gambling harm would decrease if the market becomes uh, regulated? It is possible to reduce harm about, uh, related to gambling disorder if the market is uh, regulated, but it's still dilemmatic if we can make gambling is uh, legal in Indonesia. We need um, many things to do uh, to um, um, many things to do about infrastructure and about regulation and then uh, the health treatment. So I think many things to do uh, from government sector, from uh, health, uh, health sector, and also uh, from many collaboration uh, sector to uh, to make infrastructure, important infrastructure to make it uh, regulated. But it's possible to reduce the harm reduction, but many things to do to make it uh, real. Thank you, Zolt. Thank you. Thank you. And there's one more question for any of you related to, to if, if services are provided in prison in any of these countries or if you have any experiences. In New Zealand, yes, we provide services in prison as well, gambling treatment services. Yeah. No. Okay, and I have one more question that Maria, you mentioned the 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 issue of stigma and stigmatization, and and I would be really curious just to hear a little bit more about it. If if you have any programs uh, related to yeah, just aiming to this stigmatize that stigmatized issue and. Yeah. The the Ministry of Health is intending to run us to, to to conduct some research or to to commission some research looking at destigma stigma and destigmatization, and then to conduct some public health campaigns. But that has not happened yet. It's <laughs> that we we just are aware. We've been aware for a long time that there is an issue, um, but finally the Ministry of Health has um, decided that yes, we need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, important to recognize, uh, recognize the different types of stigma as well. So there's the self-stigma, which often leads to feelings of shame and acts as a barrier to help seeking. And then there's public stigma, which can often, um, I guess, mar the sort of the sort of discourse around um, gambling problems uh, in the public and make sort of um, people, you know, which also contributes to people fe feeling shamed and not not likely to to seek help. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, well, all time is up, but it was really, it is a very exciting discussion and uh, and very exciting uh, presentations. Again, thanks to all of you for being with us uh, today and tonight. I mean, it's getting really late in New Zealand and, and also in Australia. So, so, so special thanks for that. And also thank, 
thanks for the audience to to join us and for the questions and the discussion. And uh, yeah, we will send uh, information about our next uh, edition soon. And I uh, hope you will have a nice day further or a nice evening. That it's time to start our webinar and the first speaker.